World Bank predicts 24.8% inflation for Nigeria in 2024. NNPC owes marketers $3 billion. And finally, Zimbabwe Stock Exchange begins trading in new gold-backed currency. Here's our talking point on the show today. Welcome to Business Edge. I am Perpetual Fasomi Peter. We'll begin with stories from across the continent. Stay with us. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has secured the conviction of 23 illegal bureau de change operators and narrow racketeers within the last month as the commission arrested and arraigned 174 similar offenses. The EFCC Special Task Force also arrested 116 illegal BDC operators, currency racketeers in Enugu State during a massive clampdown. During the Enugu clampdown, the EFCC recovered 110.7 million naira, $8,368, 145 pounds, 2,725 euro, 900 South African rand, 32,700 francs and 100 takia, and 500 bank Mozambique currencies. Markets are expecting a later start to the interest rate cutting cycle in the United States and South Africa, which is causing some mild volatility in the rand as the mood shifts from hopeful to pragmatic. The South African rand is currently enjoying some strength, but this could be short-lived as markets are not holding out much hope for interest rate cuts anytime soon. While the rand reached 18.48 rand to the dollar in March, a much stronger position than the 19.25 rand per dollar position it started a month in it, it has since managed to hold around 18.60 rand to the dollar as risk sentiment improved. The Bank of Uganda State of the Economy report has reported that Uganda's foreign exchange reserves fell by about 12% between June 2023 and January 2024. This decline was primarily attributed to external debt payments and the central bank's inability to buy foreign currency due to a slide in the Ugandan shilling. The reserves dropped from $4.07 billion in June to approximately $3.58 billion at the end of January, reaching 3.4 months of import cover, excluding all project-related imports. The Bank of Uganda targets a foreign exchange cover of four months of import, excluding oil projects. It is worth noting that Uganda's total public debt stood at $24.7 billion at the end of 2023, with 60% of it being external debt. The decline in foreign exchange reserves and increasing public debt have posed challenges to the country's fiscal stability and impacted spending priorities. We'll take a break now. When we'll come back, we'll bring you our first conversation for today. Stay with us. Don't go away. Glad to know you're still with us. Just to watch Business Edge. The World Bank forecasts Nigeria's inflation to fall to 24.8% in 2024 and 15.1% by 2026 expecting tighter monetary policy and a stable exchange rate to bring it down. The Brenton Wood Institution also projects moderate economic growth in Nigeria, but stresses the need for reforms to accelerate non-oil sector development. And for more on this, I'm joined by Ayo Deji Ebo, Managing Director and Chief Business Officer, Optimus by Afroinvest. Thank you, uh, Ayo Deji, for joining me today. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. All right, let me begin by asking you what your inflation forecast for Nigeria is in this year and what factors you are probably basing that on. Okay, thank you. Um, so mostly the forecast is or uh, is scenario based. So on the base level, uh, on the base case, uh, the uh, forecast is around 27-28%. And uh, optimistic level will be around 26%. And um, when we look at also what are the scenarios that is expected to come to play to achieve this, first of all, looking at the base case, uh, we've seen currently uh, we're at 31.7. We're projecting to be at, to go around 32 in March. Um, the energy prices have just been reviewed. Before the end of the year, 
will not be surprised to also see the a, a, a subsequent removal of also uh, fuel subsidies, which means that energy uh, transportation costs will also go up and has direct impact on prices. I, so I, if that IODG, let, let me get your point here. I mean, from what we know, subsidy has been removed from, you know, pure motor spirit. So what other subsidy are you referring to? No, I, I'm sure that we're all aware that uh, subsidy has been turned. And the major reason, you know, the initial um, shock when it was totally removed, uh, the government felt and they saw the impact was very direct. You know, we have always advocated for a gradual removal. So, uh, and I think on the back of that, government is being sensitive, trying to see how best they can gradually face this out. And that is why it has gradually returned. Uh, subsidy has gradually returned. If you check, this is simple calculation. You look at the current exchange rates, even with the appreciation, look at the current crude oil prices, look at the landing cost, you will see that there's a major gap. So, Fuel prices should have been over 1,000 naira per litre if that is not um, if that is not uh, subsidised. So, but going back to the, the question, so if that happens, what we would advocate is a gradual removal because what typically have happened in Nigeria, you can see the electricity tariff that was suddenly moved almost 300 by almost 300 percent. If this has been done in previous years, even if it's by 25 percent every year or 20% uh, every year, we will not feel the impact. This this a kind of major shift most times causes a distortion. All right, let me come in here, Ayodeji. You know, when we talk about electricity subsidy removal, there are those who actually reply that this, the removal had been done even long before now. I mean, that's story for another day. And then talking about NNPC being, being subsidy, NNPC says they do, you know, they have the recovery and all of that, that they're not necessarily paying anything to the marketers. Again, that's a conversation we'll also be having on this show. So I'll just leave this there. But then we have a situation where you know, uh, talking about this particular projection, projection, we have the World Bank's projection, which is 24.8%, and then the federal government is 21.8%. Um, and then I'm looking at the fact that this is April, right? And then the last um, inflation figures we got from February was 31.7. And just like you said, some analysts are also projecting 32% by March. Now, wouldn't this 24.8% projection be a miracle of some sort? Yeah, it's, it's really going to, like, it, I, I like the word you use, it's going to be a miracle because it's highly unlikely, uh, given the uh, situation. Despite the appreciation of the Naira, uh, it's, we, I don't see uh, inflation averaging at 24% at the end of the year. And so I think that uh, there are still a lot of pressure points. So beyond uh, the money supply, the structural issues. So there are a lot of inefficiencies that we pay for. Pay for. So you see moving goods, for instance, from Kano to Lagos, uh, you see the cost of moving those goods is significantly high, moving them by road. But if the well, the alternative we prefer, if you move them by rail, that will be cheaper, can even bring the cost of transportation by more than half. And as a result, the cost of those goods will also reduce. And in terms of the timing, um, for uh, bringing those goods down would also improve or reduce the perishable items. So th those are some of the structural issues, the insecurity that is reducing the cultivation of food crops, which means that, you know, it's a demand and supply. So if we don't cultivate much and, and they are the time of harvest, we harvest low and that means that prices will be up. So these are some of those things that can help us reduce uh, prices of goods, uh, especially food items, which con constitute about 51% of total uh, inflation uh, basket. So if we don't look at some of these things, it's going to be highly uh, impossible for us to maybe to look at that target, despite the appreciation of the Naira that we, are, uh, we have seen in the past uh, few weeks. All right, well, staying a bit more on inflation, I remember you talked about the factors driving inflation and how it's important to address these factors. But then we know there are monetary and then there are fiscal sides to inflation in Nigeria. Do you think enough is being done to address it from both ends? I mean, looking at what the monetary authority is doing, tightening, um, you know, uh, the 
the policy and all of that. And then on the other hand, do you think the fiscal authority is really doing much to address this? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, but from the monetary perspective, yeah, we're beginning to see a bit of uh, accountability and reasonability within that space. And that's in terms of curtailing money supply. And from the fiscal side, yeah, we are seeing the, uh, the moves, if I'll put it that way, but we are yet to begin to see the results. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, there are some structural issues that we need to take care of. Oh, insecurity should be number one. If we are able to tackle insecurity, headman crisis, kidnapping, food prices will come down because farmers will be able to cultivate at large scale. I if you speak to... Ayadis, let me come in here. I, I like what you have just mentioned because I, I would like you to just probably uh, tell us what you think really contributes the most to, you know, food inflation in Nigeria. Is it insecurity? If it is insecurity, why is it so much, uh, I mean, why is it difficult to deal with? And then if we know that this insecurity is located in certain places, is there something we can do? Maybe we need to expand to some other places and then you know what, what really do we need to do something pragmatic how can we solve this situation because we cannot continue talking about inflation when we know that to a very large extent food inflation contributes the most to the bus to nigeria's inflation basket what do we do i mean we've heard the stories all over again being talked about but how can we pragmatically deal with these issues okay thank you uh, so i Insecurity is number one. You, you look at the, in terms of the contribution, the impact that, it will, that is having on food inflation, number one. And I think that um, it's the will power uh, that we think we need. Uh, we need uh, more effort. To, uh, we need the president to intensify more effort working uh, with the security agencies. So make this in the border to curtail this, if not totally eliminate this. I know a lot of efforts is currently ongoing, but there's still, because the problem has been prolonged, so there's a need to um, be very consistent in this and uh, be more pragmatic, like you said, uh, to ensure that we reduce this to, uh, to the minimum. And once we're able to do that, government can now also focus in supporting and subsidizing production. So when you see in developed climes, why you see food is like the cheapest thing that you find is because they are government subsidizing it. So you subsidize, you are subsidizing production, you are creating jobs, because there's a link between high unemployment rate and insecurity. What are the things we need to do to make people get occupied and get them engaged? And as a result, you will begin to see that uh, insecurity level will begin to come, come down. So it's, I don't think it's rocket science and if, for any government if you want to. So yes, it may seem complex, it may seem political, but there's a need um, for, it was the head, the number one, um, who is really at this, getting this uh, out of our way. And I think everyone will also fall in line and ensure that everything is done. All right, yeah, in so closing. I think, yeah, go thanks. Go ahead, go All ahead. ahead. Yeah, okay. so I, I want to just wrap up that the second factor that we need to look at is the inefficiencies, the bottlenecks. And with some of the contracts that have been awarded on the rail system, we need to fast track this because cost of moving goods, we all pay for these inefficiencies. And also is this, um, you see a lot of uh, what I would call um, stops on the road when people that uh, you have to pay a certain amount to move move your goods on the road. All those things are factored into the cost of the item by the time it gets to its location. So if we actually want food to be cheaper, then we need to also look at what are those items that are constituting a major cost. In, apart from the cost of getting the food produce, what are those other things? What can government do to improve on them? And as we do that, it would a bit of stability, um, supporting farmers, increasing our production, high yield crops, that all those things would really help significantly. And as a result, if we're able to taper and bring down food inflation, you will see that the overall food, uh, overall inflation 
would also come down with what we are seeing okay. within the FX um, level now. I, I like what you just said about the FX. I think we should just wrap it up there. Now, many analysts have actually said immediate action on dollar illiquidity that's on availability and all of that is crucial for effective inflation management now just for context do you think the stability currently being experienced in the foreign exchange market is a result of liquidity and two i mean let's wrap tie this together how sustainable is this current stability okay the first uh, answering your first question yes is a result of liquidity so you would see that even with all the policies that the CBN has introduced in the past few weeks, they have also increased supply. So maybe um, some most uh, the strategy was to first of all introduce this policy and now increase supply. So we are already seeing the supply. You can see the sale going on at the BDC uh, uh, road exchange um, segment of the market on a weekly basis. That is also helping. Then we also seen panic sell. So a lot of those that are speculated on the on the Naira are also selling. There's also okay, Ayodeji, let's close on this. How sustainable is this model? How sustainable is it without necessarily you know increasing production or you know doing other things that can bring in the dollars? Is this is just a short term measure? The sustainable uh, strategy is to in, improve on our non oil uh, revenue, non oil exports. That is the sustainable way. Even if you raise euro bonds and do every other thing, it's only going to be an FPI coming in. It's going to be uh, short-lived. But the sustainable way is to begin to put more effort in increasing our non-oil exports. All right. Thank you so much, Adeja Bo, MD, Optimus by Afri Invest. I mean, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Do enjoy the rest of your holiday. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we have more for you today on Business Edge. Don't go away. Glad to know you're still with us. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has been reported to owe around $3 billion to oil traders for imported petrol. Five sources close to the matter reviewed that the National Oil Companies, however, clearing the overdue payments for the imported oil, although the pace of repayment has been relatively slow. The slow pace of repayment indicates that few subsidies, which were discontinued in May 2023, will take time to recover, depleting the NNPC's import budget. And joining me for more on this is Senior Vice President and Head of Investments at Sankara Investments, Victor Aluyi. Thank you, Victor, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. All right, I want us to begin by clearing this up. Are these monies owed to marketers pre-subsidy removal? No, they're, they're, they're not, because uh, pre-subsidy removal, uh, over the last couple of years, essentially, the NNPC has pretty much remained the sole importer of uh, you know, uh, PMS, refined petroleum products. So these are not monies that uh, predated the removal of subsidy, because like I said before, then the NNPC was essentially the sole importer. So these are monies that um, have, uh, you know, been sort of accumulated after the removal of subsidy, which at some point sort of became untenable because of, um, number one, the movement in FX, and obviously only recently uh, what we've seen in oil prices uh, as well. If you recall, you would see that, um, you know, the pump prices really have barely moved since the removal of subsidy. So uh, it, it again is to say that um, these prices have uh, sort of remained somewhat subsidized, and those subsidy monies, uh, you know, essentially what is uh, creating that difference that is pretty much being owed right now. All right, so well, basically looking at this particular issue now, first, let, let's stay a bit on this subsidy conversation. The NNPC had said that, you know, there is no subsidy whatsoever, adding that, you know, it sort of recovers the full cost from the products being imported. Now, what does this mean, essentially, when you're saying you're recovering the full cost from products being imported? And then could this be what is responsible for the delay in payment? So the thing is this, right? So if you look at when subsidy was removed, prices went from about 100 naira plus to over 500 naira. Now, in the aftermath of that removal, we've seen, you, you have to look at, there are various components of these uh, uh, products that are imported. The, the FX component is a major part of it because these products are, you know, quoted or imported in US dollars. As the naira weakened against the dollar, it obviously became more expensive from a naira perspective to bring these things in. So even the uh, the pump prices obviously needed to be adjusted, but obviously 
because of the most likely social implications that that could have, uh, you know, the, the government opted not to make that adjustment. And in the absence of that adjustment, the difference needed to be paid, right? So that difference is what we're talking about now, when that has not been paid over the last couple of months. And um, with the sort of gains that we're seeing with the, the Naira situation uh, over the last month or so, I think it's provided some impetus for the NNPC to start clearing that up as well. So I think that's the situation we're pretty much in and where we find ourselves right now. Okay, I want us to get this correctly. You know, what you just talked about, is it the same thing which, you know, what NNPC said, talking about them recovering the full cost from the products being imported? Is that another word for subsidy payment? What exactly are we, I mean, what exactly is happening? We need some form of transparency to understand what we're talking about now. I mean, I just explained what exactly is going on, right? Um, whether they are recovering or whether it's the semantics they're using there. You know, exactly. So it's that semantics. I want us to nail it on the head. What exactly is happening? Are we saying that, you know, the federal government is still paying subsidy removal, even though it calls it some form of um, recovery and all of that? So like, the, like, like I said, um, since subsidy was removed, the prices really haven't. However, the Naira has weakened significantly against the dollar. Like I also said, you know, these products are priced in dollars. So if the Naira has weakened, the prices ought to have moved. I mean, if you look across West Africa, you know, the prices that they are paying significantly higher than what we're paying. So clearly that difference has to be paid in some way, shape or form. Whether you want to call it subsidy or something else, that's a different thing entirely. But that difference has to be paid. We're not paying at the pump the full price of what has been imported. Uh, but I like what you said about, you know, how much it has been sold generally. And I think I'll just uh, start on that. Data from Argus Media actually talked about the highest recorded market price for petrol in West Africa in February being 1,229 naira per liter. And that's 150% higher than the government's June price cap. Now, prices have dropped to around 912 naira per liter, but they remain 295 naira higher than the capped price of six. 170 naira in Nigeria. Now, if this isn't some form of subsidy, what is? And of course, uh, uh, it's a good thing that we've been able to clear that. But then, for how long would the federal government be able to cap the price at 617 naira? Is this sustainable? I mean, it really may, remains to be seen, right? Um, one of the major challenges that really has led to that is the FX situation. I mean, when, when the administration came to power uh, May of last year, uh, FX was around 600, 700 thereabouts, right? So right now, we're around one, two. Now, if we, the, the policies that the CBN has continued to pursue, if they continue to produce gains and we see the narrow sort of gain against the USD and get to a point where, you know, it really makes a lot of sense, then we see uh, this model remains sustainable. But if there is a breakaway, like a situation where we had earlier in the year, where we had 1,800, if that situation had continued, then obviously this would not have been sustainable. So because of the gains that we have seen on the FX front for the Naira, I think that, you know, it's basically put us on a path um, that, that is sustainable, such that, you know, before the year runs out, uh, it is likely that what the government is needing to pay in terms of that difference it's not much. Again, you have to then consider the international price of crude oil, which has been on the ascendancy over the last couple of weeks. So that's another factor as well. But, but I think that once that FX side is significantly dealt with, it will you know, help very, very much to ensure that that difference really isn't much and doesn't remain a problem for, for very long. You know, speaking of FX, are you confident that we're on the right path? Are you confident that, you know, this stability will be sustained? Absolutely, I, I am. I mean, the, the, I think that you know the, the 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 monetary authorities have taken the the right decisions, uh, albeit tough and difficult. But I think that the tightening stance that they are on, I mean, we've seen some of the results already. We've come from about one thousand nine hundred to about one two thereabout. Uh, again, there's been you know better liquidity where the Apex Bank is now being sell to BDCs to essentially control the retail parts of that market. A number of circulars have also come out that will ensure that supply continues to improve. I think that if they stay on the cadence of what they have been doing, this would certainly um, you know, be sustainable uh, in the near to the medium term. All right, so do you see any impact as a result of these monies that are being owed marketers? I mean, it, does it have any impact either for the economy, NNPC, or even the marketers? I mean, it, it does. It typically would have had you know, a more debilitating impact if, for instance, 
the FX situation had not sort of come under some kind of control. For instance, if we're now doing 2005 or whatever to the dollar, it will become a much more difficult situation for the government to sort of manage. You know, you're going to be requiring even more resources to try and plug that gap, and that could create, you know, significant problems. But I think that with the, uh, you know, sort of gains that we've seen, uh, it, it puts us on a path where, you know, this can certainly be uh, better managed. But make no mistake, it, it was important that... Um, you know, that subsidy move was made at this time uh, in, in the history of our economy to really put us on a path uh, from a fiscal standpoint that is truly sustainable. All right. Well, looking at uh, Nigeria's oil and gas sector uh, generally, do you think Dangote refinery is the silver bullet? Well, not just Dangote and other private refineries that are springing up. I mean, for Dangote, we already have diesel. Jetty One is next. And then petrol should also, you know, hit the market soon. Uh, what do you think about this? I mean, there really isn't any silver bullet, right? These are moves that will continue to be uh, incrementally positive, uh, really, for that space. Uh, beyond the downstream, there also needs to be significant investment in our upstream, uh, in the upstream sector of that industry. Uh, so that would also prove very crucial in ensuring that the value chain uh, remains really, really sustainable. Um, you know, but I think that you know what we've seen with the refinery is a huge, huge step. We're also seeing, obviously, the uh, government refineries, uh, a lot of the turnaround maintenance that's going on, particularly the Portacot refinery and the estimation of government, and that would also start refining products. You know, so all of these would certainly help. But the critical thing again, you have to consider, you know, the price of crude oil in, in, in the international market, uh, particularly with the stance that the government is not wanting to pay uh, or to subsidize these things, you know, going forward because of the fiscal implications that they have on the budget. Uh, it is important to keep an eye on those prices because whether they refine or not, uh, Nigerians will still have to pay because these things are priced in U.S. dollars. All right. Well, frankly, we, we cannot underestimate the need for, you know, transparency in this space. How do we ensure transparency? I mean, I just thought to myself, why do we? But really, how can transparency and accountability be entrenched in NNPC's dealings and processes? Moving on. I mean, I mean, there are laws. Uh, at the end of the day, um, these laws just have to be adhered to, uh, to ensure that, you know, uh, things are clear. The, the petroleum industry... Um, act essentially has, I believe, created the foundation, if you will, that will help to um, uh, create the environment for even better accountability and transparency going forward. It's not going to happen in one fell swoop, but I think that the steps, uh, we've taken the, the, the steps in the right direction that ensures that uh, we ultimately get there. All right, thank you, Victor Louis, Senior Vice President and Head of Investments at Sankara Investments. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Asian stocks traded higher on Wednesday despite Fitch rating downgrade to China, which led to a mild domestic sell-off. In early European trades, the Pan Region Euro Stocks 50 futures, German DAX futures, and FTSE futures were all up. U.S. stock futures, the S&P 500 e minis also showed an increase. MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan was up, and the yield on benchmark 10-year Treasury notes was slightly lower. Fitch affirmed China's sovereign rating at A+, but downgraded the outlook to negative, citing a forecasted slowdown in economic growth. China's blue-chip CSI 300 index and the Shanghai Composite experienced fluctuations, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng index traded up. Australian shares were up, while Japan's Nikkei stock index was down. And finally, Fitch Ratings has revised its outlook on China's sovereign credit rating to negative due to concerns over risks to public finances and the uncertainty faced by the economy in transitioning to new growth models. This follows a similar move by Moody's in December. Fitch highlighted the challenges in China's public finance, including decelerating growth and increasing debt. It expects China's government debt to rise to 61.3% of GDP in 2024, a substantial increase from 38.5% in 2019. The rating agency also forecast a rise in the general government deficit. Despite the negative outlook, feature firm China's issued default rating at A+. China's finance ministry expressed regret over Fitch's decision and pledged to take measures to prevent and resolve risks from local government debt. Moody's had issued a downgrade warning in December, citing concerns over the cost of bailing out local governments and controlling the property crisis. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we have more for you on Business Edge. Stay with us.
The Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, ZSE, has launched trading in Zimbabwe Gold, ZIG, the new gold-backed currency replacing the Zimbabwean dollar. Denominations range from 1 to 200, with an exchange rate of ZIG 1 to 2,498.7242 Zimbabwean dollar on the ZSE. ZIG aims to combat inflation and stabilize the economy. The currency is backed by a composite basket of foreign currency and gold reserves held by the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. The government requires companies to pay at least half of their tax obligations in ZIG with reserves of 100 million US dollars in cash and 2,522 kilograms of gold. The central bank provides strong backing for the currency. And joining me for more on this is Dr. Prosper Chitambara, a developmental economist. Thank you, Dr. Prosper, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, first, I'd like to get your reaction to ZSE, you know, launching trading in Zimbabwe gold. I mean, what do you make of that? I'm sure you anticipated that. Yeah, definitely we anticipated that. I think it's also in line with the new mandate policy agenda and trust that has been announced by the central bank. So that's part of the alignment process. Uh, was once the mandate policy has been announced and unveiled, we expect that all the other policies at sectoral level must now be aligned to and complement uh, the mandate policy uh, uh, statement. All right. Well, Justin Boney, that's the ZSE CEO, actually announced that the indices will be rebased to 100 basis points you know, in a bit to sort of allow the indices to accurately reflect the performance of the market yes, yes. in the context of yes, the new currency. Does. Now, I'd like you to talk to us about how investors are reacting to this and, you know, what your own thoughts are. Well, investors um, are generally cautious and optimistic uh, of uh, the whole mandate policy uh, statement in general. Uh, the, the, yes, there is some renewed hope and optimism that um, maybe things could work out for the better. Maybe we have learned uh, from our past mistakes uh, and uh, we could uh, be at the, verge of, at the verge rather of doing things maybe differently uh, to ensure the sustainable or the sustainability in terms of uh, of the macroeconomy. Because as long as the macroeconomic environment is not stable, it affects uh, investments either on the stock exchange and even investments in the other sectors uh, of the economy. The economy can't grow sustainably uh, within an, in an environment that is largely unstable uh, with a lot of uncertainties. Well, talking about Zimbabwe's currency, really, historically, Zimbabwe has struggled with hyperinflation. We remember uh, in 2008, it issued a $100 trillion note, and you know, it has since switched from foreign currencies, bond notes, gold coins, and even a gold-backed di digital currency. Now, in 2019, it revived the Zimbabwean dollar with stringent rules, you know, before permitting the use of foreign currencies in March 2020. Why did these measures fail? Are there any lessons that you think yeah. you know, have been taken so far that would probably ensure that we do not make the same mistakes or Zig doesn't go the same way? Yeah, it, it definitely there are, there, there are some lessons that have been learned. And one of those lessons is the need to discontinue any passive fiscal activities and also the need, the importance of limiting a government's overdraft facility uh, at the central bank. Uh, and I'm happy that at least uh, in terms of passive fiscal activities, uh, that that has actually stopped and also even in terms of uh, government borrowing money from the central bank that has also stopped so i would say traditionally our major challenges have emanated from unsustainable growth in money supply which has spawned a uh, chronic high inflation and because of the chronic high inflation economic agents have lost confidence uh, in the local currency and we've seen the dollarization of, of the economy and once economic agents have lost confidence and trust in a currency, it takes a very, very long time to restore uh, that confidence. So I think the, the challenge of confidence, that's the biggest challenge that we actually face as an economy, uh, such that uh, even with the new currency, without um, uh, walking the talk in terms of implementing the monetary policy, I think it's going to take a bit of time. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to ensure that restoration of confidence such that people uh, are uh, confident uh, to hold uh, the local currency as a store of value or even uh, as a medium of, of exchange. So what has been happening uh, with the Zimbabwe dollar, for example, is that you get paid in Zimbabwe dollar and immediately after getting paid, you have to substitute uh, that Zimbabwe dollar 
uh, into the USD as a way of uh, uh, preserving your value. So that process has actually resulted in an increase in the demand uh, for the US dollar, which has also caused the local currency to, to depreciate. So uh, th I think that's the challenge we need to deal with. But I'm hoping that if we are able to sustain low and stable inflation for at least six months, and by low and stable inflation, I'm referring to uh, inflation of below 10%. If we can have a single digit inflation rate for at least six months, I think that will go a long way uh, in terms of restoring confidence uh, in the local currency, uh, even in the new currency by, by economic agents. So I think ultimately, uh, it's, it's, it's about uh, the attainment of these key benchmarks, uh, such as uh, for a re reduction of uh, inflation and also even boosting our, our reserves. I think that was also critical. Dr. Dr. Chitambara, just before we go, I'd like you to just tell us, I mean, do you have concerns about the basket of currencies, you know, that this particular ZIG is uh, backed by? Uh, I mean, are there risks uh, as a result of that? Let's close on that. No, I think uh, I don't. I don't have a problem. In fact, it's actually backed by uh, largely by gold and by 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 the USD. Uh, of course, we need to build up on our reserves. Uh, we, we currently have uh, about two hundred and eighty-five million dollars worth of reserves. So my view is that that may not be adequate. I think we need to to to, to boost that as a way of ensuring that there's greater confidence uh, All right. in 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 this bubble gold. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Prosper Titanbara, Development Economist, for your time on Business Edge today. Thanks so much. For that's our offering on the show today, you can follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can also go to our website, www.newscentral.africa. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasomi Peter. Bye for now.